Bibles are still open to Isaiah chapter 32, and if you would, go ahead and find Revelation 19 and mark it, Revelation 19 and mark that, then back to Isaiah 32. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up, the men are ready to help you with that. Preaching through the book of Isaiah, tremendous book, a challenging book to study, a challenging book to heed, and we know that God speaks to us through it. God is talking to His people, primarily Judah, the southern kingdom, but also flows over to the northern kingdom of Israel as well, but he's speaking to his people by the prophet Isaiah, mostly about judgment, mostly about correction, mostly about uh, the trials that are coming because they had forsaken uh, their God. But intermixed in that is some great promises, some great challenges, some great hope, because God's not done with his people. By the way, he's still not done with his people. Uh, the New Testament tells us that very clearly, that he has not forsaken them. But he's not done with his people, so he's got some great promises for them, looking forward to the millennial reign. But also, it's speaking to us. We as God's people, by adoption through Abraham, but also by faith, and also just by the fact of him using us and his bride and his church. So God speaks to us through this, because we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration, and it's there for our instruction. And so we take instruction as, from it as well. So, we're picking up in chapter 32. Now, I have to give you a little bit of a warning. It's a little bit of a long train this morning. All right? Hope you didn't come to get out, but we're going to be careful about that. So, I may have to unhook the train about part way through. Don't let it crash on you, all right? So, we'll try to do that gently if I have to do that. But as I was studying and looking at this this morning, I said, Lord, that's so much we'd like to cover more in detail. But So, we'll just see how the Lord leads this morning, let the Spirit lead. So, if I have to disconnect... Partway through, we'll just disconnect. But in the meantime, let's see what God has for us. Looking this morning at setting things right. Setting things right. God here in chapter 32 is kind of between woes. In this section of Isaiah, as God's speaking to his people, it's woe. He gives warning. He said, there's some things we have to deal with. There's some things you need to pay attention to. There's some warnings I've got for you. By the way, I'm glad God warns us. I'm glad God cares enough to say, whoa, pay attention. I've got something for you. I want to help you with something. I want to warn you about something. And God who is just, God who is holy, he says, hang on, I've got some things to deal with. And so as he's talking to his people, we're kind of between woes. In fact, chapter 33 begins with another. It says, woe to thee. And so we're talking about woes. He just finished up a woe, talking to the children of Israel. Because if you remember, they looked to Egypt for help. They looked to Egypt for security. They looked to Egypt for pleasure. We know that Egypt is a picture of the world and of sin, but also it's the people they've been in bondage to. They've been slaves to. And God had, by the, by the blood, had brought them out, delivered them out of slavery, out of Egypt, and taken them to the promised land. And now when they were in trials, and now when they were in troubles, instead of looking to the one who delivered them already, they were looking back at the ones who had them enslaved. And we know for us that's so true of Christians today. We, we pray to God, we get saved, we get pulled out of that mess of the world, and then as soon as the opportunity comes, we're looking back to it. We're wanting its help, we're wanting its approval. And so God was trying to deal with them about that and say, no, don't do that. Don't look to those just because they, you think they're strong. I'm much stronger. Don't look to those because you think they're wise. He said, I am much wiser. And so God's dealing with him. So he just had that woe. And here as he leaves that woe and heads to the next woe, he begins to remind them about something more important coming. He says, look to the future. That will change your desire. That will change who you look to. That will change who you desire. That changes what you want. If you and I can remember to look a little bit ahead, amen, a little bit ahead beyond the next presidential election, beyond the next uh, economic downturn and upswing, beyond our retirement, beyond those things, and realize where we are and the important things that God has given us about eternity, it will change the way we act, it will change by our decisions, it will change our habits, it will change our lifestyle. And so here God is trying to remind them about looking ahead, and by looking ahead, He's going to say we need to set some things right. He talks about some things He's going to set right, and He reveals to us some things we need to set right. And so that's what we're looking at in this passage. Now we know the Bible teaches us that uh, all Scripture has one interpretation. 
I mean, one basic truth that it's trying to say. One thing that God is explaining. But there are many applications. We take that interpretation, what's being done, but then God applies it. Jesus did it over and over, taking the truths of the Old Testament, events of the Old Testament, passages of the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus uh, quoted more from Isaiah than any other book. And so as he takes those truths, he then applies it to the present life. And so God has done that for us. So he pauses. Are you still there? That's why sometimes you have to open your eyes a little bit, nod a little bit, and make sure you were still with me. So he pauses in these set of warnings and judgment to remind them there's a, a day coming. There is a day coming that is going to make things different. By the way, we sing that song very often. There's a great day coming. Boy, let's don't forget, there is a day coming that's going to be different and set things right. And so he then teaches them about that day and about some truths that we need today about setting things right. So we're looking at how he says to them he's going to set things right and then how we set things right. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a lot to set right. Our churches have a lot to set right. Our homes have a lot we've got to get set right. Our nation has a lot we've got to set right things right. And so we're going to let God speak to us this morning, and I'm going to be try as brief as I can, but let the Holy Spirit fill in the holes, if you will. As we speak about a certain truth in a certain area God is dealing with, let the Holy Spirit for you put in the truth. Let the Holy Spirit for you say, this is what you need in that passage. This is what you need to do about that truth. This is what you need to change in your life. This is what you need to add in your life, because we all need to add and take away. Hello. So we're looking at this this morning. So let God speak to us and let the Holy Spirit point out to you. Don't get mad at God. Don't get mad at His Word. Let Him speak to you because He does love us and He does want to make things right. So with that in mind, here it is. Let God speak to us this morning like we're, like we're the children of Israel. That God is speaking to us from Isaiah directly like we've never heard it before. And God's trying to deal with us. Reminding us between the woes, between the judgments, saying, hey, I've got some hope for you. I've got some help for you. So here we go. Here's a reminder. He reminds them they'll change their perspectives, they'll change their paradigms. First of all, he reminds them very clearly the crowning of an incredible king. The crowning of an incredible king. He said, right now you've got problems. He says, your kings aren't that good. Your enemies are out there about, around about you. And he said, some of your kings have gotten you in trouble. He said, but I want to remind you, there is coming. There is a king, an incredible king that is coming. In other words, he says, I'm going to set the government right. Wouldn't you like to set our government right? Wouldn't you like God to step in and set our government right? I think about the only way to do that is to get rid of it. I'm, I'm not proclaiming we do that. I'm glad I'm an American, but you know what I'm saying? God wants, God, if God could just step in and set our government right and set our policies right, what a wonderful thing. But he's saying we're going to, he's going to set the government right. Now, by interpretation, he's talking here, I believe, in two aspects. One, the near future. And I believe he's talking about King Hezekiah that's going to come. And through Hezekiah, the Assyrians are going to be defeated in a, in a marvelous way, in a miracle way, without Egypt's help. But also there's a distant future God is reminding them about, about the coming Messiah, about the King of kings and Lord of lords, that Christ that is coming. See, the Jews knew King Messiah was coming. They didn't know it was going to be Jesus. That's the name that was given there in the New Testament. They knew the Messiah, the Christ, was coming. In fact, that's why the Jews didn't respond appropriately sometimes to Jesus because he was not acting as the king they thought they were looking for. They were looking for the king to set things right, right then. They were, the Jews were looking for the Messiah to come and kick out the Romans. They were, they were underneath the Roman control. And they didn't like the Romans. They didn't like paying Roman taxes. That sounds familiar. They said, we don't want that. And when the Messiah comes, well, I can just hear those priests say, well, when the Messiah comes, these Romans are out of here. We're going to put our foot back on the Romans' neck, and he's going to lead us in that. So when Jesus came and says, no, pay your taxes... When he said, no, submit to the authority, they said, this can't be him. This is not the one we are looking for. But they knew a king was coming. They knew there was coming a kingdom. And so here God reminds them, even between these woes, he said, hey, get your thinking right. Set your minds right. He says, because, verse number one, behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. Oh, he's coming. He's coming. He came the first time as that lamb. He's coming back the next time as the king to reign and to rule. In fact, the Bible tells us, let's just take a little leap forward in history. This could happen a thousand and seven years from today. If you're a 
calendar market, you can market. This could happen a thousand and seven years from today. Revelation chapter 19, because he is coming. I want you to notice his coronation. His coronation. He is coming. He will be set up as king. This is yet to happen, and God tells us. In Revelation chapter 19, a little teaching this morning, as we look at prophecy, verse number 14. Oh, let's back up a little bit. I love this passage. Let's go to verse number 11. You don't have anywhere to go tomorrow. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat upon him was called Faithful, capital F, Jesus Christ, and True, capital T, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's us, clothed in white linen and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, and with it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them. There's that ruling, with the rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Chapter 20, verse number 4. It tells us a little bit about that reigning and how long that's going to be. In chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not until, loved not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is the holy, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's just a little glimpse of the coronation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when he comes. He's going to come on that white horse and we're going to follow him. The battle of Armageddon is going to be there. It's going to be a bloody battle, but not a very hard one. And he's going to win and we're going to win and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And so that's what the Jews are looking for. That's what the Jews are anticipating their Messiah to come and set up the kingdom. And so that could happen a thousand and seven years from today. If Jesus came right now and raptured his people out, we'd have seven years of tribulation, and at the end of the tribulation, we'd have that thousand years we're talking, well, take it's only seven years, right? Yeah. But he'll reign for that thousand years. So I was wrong by a thousand years. You'll forgive me, won't you? I'm off by a thousand. Seven years from today, he could come. Wow. Think about that. Doesn't that excite you just a little bit? The rapture could occur today, and he could then come down and be coronated in a seven years from today, and then we would rule with him for a thousand years. So that's what the Jews were talking about. So if you really believe that a th seven years from today, Jesus could reign on this earth, that he would be in Jerusalem, and he'd be ruling with the rod of iron, and you say, boy, I know it. I know seven years from today, I guarantee you the decisions you made today in your finances would be different. I'm sure today the decisions you made in raising your family would be different. I'm sure the decisions we made today about what our next few years are going to be like would be different if we really believed seven years from today he could come back and reign. And that's why he said, let's, say, let's get things right. He said, I'm warning you about these woes and things. He says, but there's a king coming. So we find his coronation. First of all, his pure reign. He's going to have a pure reign. Verse number one. And behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. I wonder if there'd be any change in Washington if they had to rule and reign in righteousness. Think there'd be any difference if they all had to be holy? Think it'd be any difference if the Republicans and the Democrats and the president and vice president and all were holy? I think we'd have different laws going through. I think we'd have some laws that wouldn't go through. But he's going to reign in righteousness. Whoa, his coronation. He's going to have a pure reign. There'll be no sin allowed. There'll be no rebellion allowed. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time as he rules with a rod of iron. But not just his pure reign, but notice his princes rule also. Notice what it says. And princes shall rule in judgment. We just read that there's going to be folks that rule with him. He's going to be king, but he's going to have folks under him that will rule with him. You say, who's that? That's his people. That's the people that follow him. In 2 Timothy 2, verse number 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign 
with Him. God says if we suffer, if we follow Him, we will reign with Him. There we saw those who came going to reign with Him. So with His coronation, yes, He's going to be made King, but also we get to reign with Him. Not because of anything we've done, but because of all the things that He's doing. But we get to rule and reign with Him. Ladies and gentlemen, if we understand we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ on this very world, well, that ought to change our life. It ought to set things right in our mind. It ought to set things right in our heart. Say, well, I'm worried about this. I'm not worried about nothing because the king is coming he's going to put all things right and i will be able to reign with him so we see his coronation he's coming he tries to remind them so i'm going to set your government right but not just his coronation it describes his care his care look at verse number two and a man it says behold a king verse number two and a man and i believe he's speaking about the same man this king the Lord Jesus Christ, and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. We see his care. We see him as our protector. See, when we understand the king is coming, and that king is our protector, that one who's going to rule and reign in righteousness, the one who is God Himself, He is our protector. Notice, notice what it says. He shall be as an hiding place from the wind and a covered or a covering from the tempest. By the way, I'm glad I'm held safe by Jesus Christ. I'm glad that in those storms, in those winds, in those difficulties, He is my hiding place. Psalm 23, 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble and shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. See, we're going to have storms. At family camp, I was teaching that in our family seminar. Back, we're going to have, you're going to have storms. Put it down. You're going to have some storms. Some of your storms are going to be huge storms. Some of your storms will be smaller storms. But we're going to have storms. But my king, is the one who protects me from those storms. Doesn't mean I'm not going through it. Doesn't mean I might get a little bit damp. I might get a little wet. But I don't have to fear because He is my protection. He is my hiding place in those storms. I see Christians all the time, oh, I've got such a problem, such a turmoil, such, and they're just nervous wrecks. Don't you understand that we have a king that's going to come, and he is our king, and he is our protector in the storms. Yes, we don't want storms to come, but when they come, we've got that protection. I'm glad he's our protector. You say, preacher, I'm so worried about this. No, God is our protector. Secondly, we see He's our provider and preserver. Our provider and preserver. Verse number 2 again, And a man shall be a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place. Not rivers of water in a swampy place. Not rivers of water in a flooded place. But rivers of water in what kind of place class? dry place as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land a dry place yet lots of water lots of refreshment lots of provision lots of care for us lots of water that we need even in that dry place i'm glad he can provide for me even in a dry place Say, oh, but preacher, what about when the, when the government does this and things in our nation go this way? God can provide. That's the king I have, and that's the king that's coming, and that's the one who can serve me, provide for me. He provides me, and he preserves me. It talks there about as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. We sing that song all the time. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Oh, I'm glad he is. So you put the... Put those thoughts together, the water and the rock, the preservation and the protection, and the thing brings us to 1 Corinthians 10.4. The Jews would understand it. When you talk to the Jews about a rock that protected them, when you talk to the Jews about a rock that provides for them, when you talk to the Jews and mention rock and water and dry places, their mind went one to one place. That's in the wilderness where that rock that followed them and that water gushed out. Remember how they were there were looking for water and they were thirsty and God had Moses take that staff and go smite that rock rock the bible tells us that rock is jesus and he smote that rock as a picture of christ dying on the cross for us and out of that rock came 
multitudes of water, rushing waters, as the Bible talks about in the New Testament, as living water, living life. And so here we find that rock. So the Jews would know, hey, he's the king. Yes, he's coming, but he's also that rock. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it speaks about that rock. And did all drink the same from the same spiritual rock? For they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So the Bible says that rock followed them. Through the wilderness, through that place, the rock followed them. I don't know if they saw it rolling. I don't know if every time they stopped, they say, oh, I'm kind of thirsty, and turn around, there was the rock again. I don't know. But the rock followed them, and that rock provided for them the shadow in the wilderness, and also provided for them the water and sustenance that they need. Just think about that. It followed them to provide for them. And we serve the same God. We serve the same Christ. So we have an understanding that we've got His care over us. Ladies and gentlemen, God said, let's set our minds right. Let's set our hearts right. He said, I'm telling you about your problems here, and I'm telling you about your problems there. You've been looking to the world, to Egypt, to take care of you, to protect you. You think they're so great. You've forgotten me. He said, but don't forget me because there is a king that's coming, and he's on the throne already in heaven, and he's the king that's coming, and he's your provider, and he is going to care for you, and I'm... What a joy. What a joy. He said, let's get set, set things right. Set things straight. The crowning of an incredible king. But then he moves on. He says, but there's something else I'm going to put right. Something else that needs to be right. He said, I'm going to put the king, the government right. I'm going to behold this king. I want you to see this king that's coming. But then he talks about the character of ideal men. The character of ideal men. He says, but he said, we got to get some changes going. We got to get some things set right. We got to set them things perfect. He says, one day it's going to change. He says, but I need you to change it now. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to change our character now. We need some men, as it speaks here, godly men, righteous men, holy men. And ladies, you can put that on your application as well, as God speaks about the character of ideal men. He said, we got to set some things right. Notice verse number two, three. And the eyes of them. Okay, now he's speaking about somebody else. Verses 1 and 2, I believe he's talking about the king, about the coming Messiah, about Jesus Christ, the king that they're looking for. And now he's talking about the men in general. He says, And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. Whoa, he said, this is what we need. He said, we've got to set some things right. We've got to set some things. He said, when the king comes, he said, this is the way it's going to be. But i got news for you. God wants it to be that way now also. By the way, we're supposed to be living the kingdom life, living the word of God. But notice the character of ideal men, setting men right. Fellas, let's let God speak to us this morning. Ladies, let God speak to you this morning, uh, as we speak to the men as well, about setting things right. What needs to be in today's society. He says, you've been looking to Egypt, you've got all these other issues. He says, but I want you to have things right in your heart, setting the men right. Number one. The right men, the right character that we have to have, as God speaks here, first of all, is clear vision. There's got to be a clearing of our vision. There's got to be a fresh focus. Verse number three, And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. We need clear vision. I mean, we've got eyes to see. Most of us in here can see. Maybe we may have glasses or bifocals or trifocals or quadruple focals. We may think we don't need glasses and run into the walls, but most of us can see. But we don't have clear vision. Our vision is distorted. Our vision is dim. Our vision is dark. And he said what, we, what he's looking for in that day and this day is that a man will be I have eyes that shall not be dim. We need vision that is clear. Isaiah 29, 18, we preached about this not too long ago. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. 
We need as God's people to have clear vision. We need to be able to see out of the darkness. We need our eyes refocused. We need our eyes cleaned up so we can see. We need a clear vision of God's purpose for our lives. We're living here in a society where our eyes are so blinded by the world and so blinded by sin and so blinded by the things we want of this old world and we, we just don't have a clear vision of what God's purpose for our life is. We need clear vision of God's purpose. We need clear vision that we're in a battle. I spoke about that at our family seminar also yesterday. And we're in a battle. Satan's after the family. Have you figured that out? Satan is out to destroy the family. Everything from marriage to child discipline to unity, Satan is out to destroy the family. And we need to be able to see that. The problem is we don't see that, and we just wake up one day and wonder, what happened to my family? What happened? Why is my kids this way? Why is my marriage this way? Why is our nation this way? We've got to have some clear vision. Today, I'm asking you, is your vision clear? Do you have spiritual insight? Can you see spiritually what's happening in our nation, in our churches, in our world? And can you see it so it stirs our heart? He said what we need is some men. The character of ideal men we need now is the same one's going to be then is some clear vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Can we see it? I'm afraid if you watch most Christians, you can tell they're not with clear vision. They stumble. They're as though Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind and they both fall into a ditch. So we've got to have clear vision, clear spiritual vision, clear understanding what's going on in the world. Secondly, not only is it clear vision, but have hearkening ears. Have hearkening ears. Verse number three, In the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. He said, they're going to be able to see clearly. We've got to be able to see clearly what's going on. And the ears of them that hear shall hearken. See, they could hear, they just weren't hearkening. They could hear, but they weren't understanding. They could hear, but they weren't paying any attention. Illustration. Teenagers. Anybody remember being a teenager? Anybody ever have a teenager? Well, we love our teenagers. We do. But sometimes teenagers hear, but they don't hearken. They hear it, but they're not listening. The word hearken there in the Hebrew means to prick up the ears. To prick up the ears. How many, how many here have, have ridden a horse more than two or three times? You've ridden a horse. Some of you. Okay. You understand the ears. You watch those ears. You may not see anything, you may not hear anything, but when they do, well, those ears prick up. Those ears turn. Those ears, listen, that's what, it, that's what it's on. Picking up. Ears pricking up. So he says, what we're looking for, some ideal men, some men that need to be there, have ears, they're hearing ears, but their ears prick up. Their ears turn too. Boy, when you come to the house of God, and you the preaching of the Word of God opens up, not because it's me, but because it's the Word of God, your ears ought to prick up. Your ears ought to turn up. Your ears ought to say, boy, I'm listening intently. I'm listening carefully. I'm listening so intently. God, speak to me. And that's what he's talking about. Ears that will hearken. Ears that will listen. Ears that will pay attention. We're talking about folks that can hear spiritually, can hear from God and hear the Word of God and hear the, the Holy Spirit as He speaks to us. But we're talking about men in this day and age that need to have clear vision, but also hearkening ears that will listen and will respond. But I'm afraid... Most of the time, it seems like we're just talking to deaf folks. Just not, their ears just don't listen. I'm asking tonight, this morning, well, let's learn to have hearkening ears. I hear what God says. I understand what God says. I'm applying that. I'm focused on it. Not just, I'm listening. Look, they're eating a hamburger. Isn't that exciting? Look, they're eating spaghetti. Wasn't that exciting? Oh, isn't that cute little dog? Oh, was the preacher talking? Is he done yet? No, hearkening ears. Learn to listen to the Word of God. But not only have hearkening ears, not only have clear vision, but the ideal man of today needs to have hearts of understanding. Hearts of understanding. See, we've got to set things right because we're not there yet. We don't have the clear vision. We don't have hearkening ears. But here he says there needs to be hearts of understanding. Notice what it says. Verse 4. The heart also of the rash. Shall understand knowledge. 
See, there's a change there. The heart of the rash that responds inappropriately, that responds unthinkingly, that responds out of ignorance, that responds out of stupidity, shall understand knowledge. We need to have men and ladies with hearts of understanding. Understanding the things of God. Understanding right and wrong. Understanding holiness and unholiness. Understanding what the will of God is, as the Bible says. Understanding the where we are in this, in this country and in this time. So, preacher, how can I get understanding? Let me give you one. Proverbs 9.10. If it's not in your notes, write it down. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. What brings that understanding is the knowledge of the what class? Holy. When we understand a little bit about holiness, when we understand a little bit about the holiness of God, when we understand a little bit about how God wants us to be holy because He's holy as He's told us, when we understand a little bit about holiness, when we have that knowledge of what holiness is, what's right and what's wrong, what's clean, what's unclean, that brings understanding. So, preacher, I have trouble understanding all that God says. Well, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit, which teaches us the Word of God. But sometimes we don't underst- we don't get the understanding because we don't have the knowledge of how holy God is. We say, why would God say that? Because He's holy. Why would God judge that? Because He's holy. Why would God want me to change that? Because He's holy. Why would God say we shouldn't do that? Because it's not holy to to do that. So when we have knowledge of the holy, that brings understanding. So here we have, he says, wait, these men, he says, we've got to have some folks that will have hearts of understanding. Understanding. We need to understand holiness. We need to understand right and wrong. We need to have understanding, as the Bible talks about the, David's men, of the times. First Chronicles 12, 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So, preacher, what should we do? If we understand the times and we understand the Word of God, we'll know what we ought to do. That's proclaim the truth. That means win souls. That means live holy. That means to give the gospel. That means to give to missions. That means to be faithful to raising our family. We know what we need to do because we understand the times that we're in. Times where immorality runs rampant. Times when we can't turn on the television or listen to the radio without filth just bombarding us. Without the world trying to tell us that what we believe is, is wrong. What we believe is 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 politically incorrect that what we believe and what we stand for this holiness that we stand is something that's vile and something that's wrong we need hearts of understanding hearts of understanding he goes on he says this is what else we need he said we need to make some changes set things right hearkening ears clear vision hearts of understanding and lips that speak correctly and clearly lips that speak correctly and clearly notice what it says Verse 4, the heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge and the tongue of the stammerers. Well, we see the change from the rash to understanding, the half-blind to the clear vision. Those that are hearing but not hearkening. We see the changes. Here's a change. A tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. God needs His people to speak His Word plainly. Are you listening to me? We need to speak it plainly. Here's what happens, though. You're at the workplace, and they're talking about homosexuality, and they're talking about all these other things, and they turn to you and say, You're a Christian. What do you think? And here's your answer. Uh, but, uh, uh, I don't know. Well, I don't want to be offensive. Well, a lot of people believe these things. Other churches, Bob, I don't know. And I think I ought to do that. Stammerers. Today's society, we need people, not with a chip on our shoulder, not being unkind, but be able to say, the Bible says this. Clearly. Clearly speaking it. Clearly, rightly. Not being angry, not being bitter, not being unkind, but be able to speak clearly. He said, we've got the king coming and we've got to have these men. We need to have some things set in order about the right kind of men, the ideal man for the society of the time. And that includes lips that speak clearly. We need to be clear in our speech. By the way, as we know the Bible, we can speak clearly. 
The more you understand the Bible, you know more what God says, you just say, thus saith the Lord. This is the word of God. You don't have to say that's your fart, you just have to say God's fart. We just have to speak clearly. Sometimes people come to church and they hear the word of God preached clearly, and believe it or not, they get upset. Guess what? Sometimes I preach it and I get upset. But God's word is very clear and we have to be able to speak it clearly. That means when we go, when you're telling folks about the fact they need to be saved, there is a hell. I said, there is a hell. It's burning forever and ever and people are tormented there. But God doesn't want anybody to go there, though we all deserve it, every single one of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. The Revelation 21, 8 tells us that's the lake of fire and brimstone. We all deserve hell and people are burning there and people who are not saved go there and spend eternity. But God loved us so much, he paid the sin debt for us. He went to the cross and died for us. And by putting our faith and trust in him, he saves us from hell so we can spend eternity in heaven because he then stamps paid in full on our sin account and we are made the righteousness of Christ in Him and we are justified in Him and we can go to heaven and God says we must get the word out because how can they believe whom they've not heard and how can they hear without a preacher? We've got to go and speak clearly. See, the idea today is nobody wants to hear about sin. Nobody wants to hear about hell. Everybody wants to think they're going to heaven and they can go to heaven but there is a hell and without Christ you go to hell and with Christ you go to heaven and we need to be clear on that, not just well, you ought to go to church and kind of make some differences in your life. No, you need to get saved. You need to trust Christ. You need to be born again. Well, take Jesus in your life and He'll help you. No, it's not just taking Jesus in your life. It's falling upon your face and being born again from the sins that you've committed against God. Boy, He's there to save. He's there to heal. But we've got to speak clearly. Clearly about the truth. Clearly about training children. Adults, don't be afraid to speak clearly to your children. I talked about that at family seminar. Boy, you talked a lot at family seminar. Yeah, I guess I did. Man, setting rules and making it clear. The Bible says we're not to, to produce wrath in our children. But we bring wrath in our children. We're not consistent. We set the rules. And we say, this is the rule. This is what happens if you break it. Then when they break it, you say, you broke it. Here's the rules. We're going to do with that. We're going to deal with that. But the idea is if you said, well, I didn't have any rules, but I got mad one day, so I punished them. That makes wrath. Or today, we're, today's the rule, and today's the rule, today's the rule, but tomorrow, well, we're not going to do the rule. Brings wrath. So we need to be in our training of children. We need to speak clearly. The world needs to know the truth. Our families need to know the truth. We need to be able to have lips that speak clearly. Stop stammering. Hello. Stop stammering. Setting things right. You see the coronation of an incredible king. Whew. He said, I'm going to help you. He said, you're looking to the world. Don't look to the world. He said, i got a king. It's going to set things right. We find the character of ideal men very quickly. Notice the correction of inaccurate estimation. He said, we need to fix some things. We need to set some things right. we got to need to correct some inaccurate estimations. You say, what are you talking about? Look at verse number 5. The vile person shall be no more called liberal. You know, it's a vile person, but they're not called vile, they're called liberal. You now, I know if you've been listening to the Rush Limbaugh that, you've got a whole idea of liberal. We'll talk about that. That's a different kind of liberal right here. But it says, the vile person shall no more be called liberal, and the curly shall be said to be bountiful. For the vile person will speak valiantly. He said, the vile person is going to be vile, and his heart will work iniquity. And there's going to be hypocrisy. He said, but we're not going to call them good. We're not going to call the bad good. We're going to stop calling the bad good. We're going to stop playing games with words. We're going to stop. We're going to correct some inaccurate estimations. He says, we've got some folks here. Well, let's put it this way. Isaiah chapter 5. We saw that a few months ago. Verse number 20. Woe to them. God says, woe. Woe to them that call evil good. And good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you haven't figured it out, that's exactly where our world is today. It's calling light darkness. I mean, you proclaim, thus saith the Lord, about whether it be family structure or about marriage or about kid raising or about anything else. You say, this is what God says. Here's the light. They say, that's dark. That's from the dark ages. That's a bunch of ignorance. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's a bunch of... No. They've called light darkness. They've called evil good. 
People often say these days that divorce rate is down. That's because marriage is down. They're just shacking up. By the way, shacking up. They still use those words around here? I'm sorry. The uh, cohabitation of adult individuals freely embracing love and respect one for another outside the bounds of matrimony and legalist rules. That's the definition of shacking up. All right? So, we say, well, you should, shouldn't. Well, but that's supposed to be normal. That's supposed to be said. We're just trying it out. We're just doing this. You can't watch television. You can't talk to your neighbors. You can't go anywhere without that being the, the good. It's not good. The marriage bed is undefiled. It's inside the marriage, not outside the marriage. And whether it be drugs, whether it be transgender, whether it be abor abortion, it's such a mess. They're calling the evil good and the good evil and the bitter for the sweet and the sweet for the bitter. And God says here, he said, we're going to fix that. We need to set things right. He says the vile, the vile, they're not going to be called liberal anymore. That idea of liberal, the vile simply means stupid, wicked, and foolish. That's what the word vile in Hebrew is. Stupid, wicked, foolish. The word, therefore, liberal means open, generous, good, open, gen Oh, aren't they good people? Aren't they nice people? Aren't they generous? Yes. God says, no, you, we're, we're going to stop calling the wicked good. We're going to stop calling the vile generous and open. By the way, God loves the vile. You hear what I said? God loves vile people. He hates their validity. But he loves the vile. Aren't you glad? Because that's us. That's us. But he said, we're not going to call the vile good. He said, we've got to correct some inaccurate estimations. Again, we're living in a society where either in the churches or certainly in our media, it's not proclaimed that way. It's time for God's people to know there's evil in the world. It's time for God's people to admit, yes, there is evil. There is right and wrong. Aren't you glad there's right and wrong? Aren't you glad God has given us that? And He's given us, but we've got to get to the place to make some changes for the right kind of people and the right kind of approach so we can have some accurate estimation of what's right and wrong. Your kids need to know that. That transgender is not good. Abortion is not good. Drugs is not good. Immoral dress is not good. Fornication is not good. It's not right. It's not good. I'm not saying we go around and point people, Oh, look, they're shacking up. Oh, no, no. But I'm just saying we have to understand what's right and what's wrong. We've got to correct estimations on what's right and wrong. The curlish means stingy, crass, evil. That's what the Hebrew means. For the curlish there, it's the stingy, crass, and evil. Bountiful means well-off, something to be desired, something to model after. <laughs> Man, we don't want to... We have to work at making sure our kids have the right heroes. Not the wicked. Not the vile. But the holy and the just and the right. Not to be something to, be, to model after the, the evil. God said, we've got to set some things right. How about it this morning? What has God pumped on your chest about? Are you ready for the king to come? Are you looking forward to His coming? Are you dreading His coming? Are you looking forward to where God puts things right? Are you dreading when God puts things right? Are we the ideal person God would have us be? The changes that need to be made in this time, in this area, clear vision. I mean, we need to see right and wrong. We need to see what God is doing. We need to see what God wants us to do. We need to see God's purpose for our individual lives. We need to see God's vision for our lives. We need to have that clear vision. We need to have ears that listen. <laughs> Instead of pulling our shoulders in and gritting our teeth and shutting our eyes and trying to shut our ears. Listen to the things of God. Have hearts that understand. And lips that speak clearly.
and then rightly be able to divide holy, unholy, clean, unclean, right, wrong, godly, ungodly. Not to judge other people, but that we might judge ourselves rightly. That we might get on the right path. That we might instruct our children. That we might lead the for the next generation should Jesus tarry. Setting things right. Again, he was speaking to Israel because they were looking to the world for help. He said, you look to them, their horses, their strength, their wisdom. He said, they're nothing. Look to me. Look to me who delivered you. Look to me who loves you. Look to me who can do what you need done. And he says, based upon that, he says, let's get some focuses right. About the king. About our character. And about our understanding. The king is coming. Are you one of his? You can be today. It's not by joining this church. It's not by giving a thousand dollars. Maybe ten thousand. No, no. You can't do that. By being born again. See, the Bible says we're all sinners. I preached sometimes kind of hard about sin because sin put Jesus on the cross he died for your sins and mine that's what he came for sin condemns people to hell but God loves us for while we were yet sinners Christ died for us well if I can just live good enough Jesus will love me no Jesus loves you anyway you can't do anything to make Jesus love you less. You can't do anything to make Jesus love you more. He may not be able to manifest His love for you like He would like if we're living wrong, but He still loves you. So, well, if I just do better, He'll love me more. No. He might be able to manifest and show that love more, but He can't love you more. He can't love you less. He loves you. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. That means go to hell. But hath everlasting life. Are you saved today? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You get saved today. Not by turning over a little leaf, but just calling and believing on the name Jesus Christ. Get saved today. Say, preacher, I am saved. All right, let's set some things right. God's looking for some folks that will just set things right in our character, in our estimation, what we need to be and what we need to do. Let's decide today that if God, as He looks down, He says, I'm looking for some folks to make a difference. I'm looking for some folks that will make the changes that I can bless and I can use that I've got plans for. Let it be, here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. Change me. Build me for Your glory and for the sakes of souls around. Let's bow our heads, please.